Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Glad to have the pastor back today. By golly. <laughs> so, scripture reading this morning is Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her vindication shines out like a dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see her vindication, and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name <coughs> that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal de 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 demon in the hand of your God. So be it. How about now? Okay. And I'll try to talk loud enough. So Kim asked me for a title, and I said Christian. That's it, Christian. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to be a Christian in this world? If you are a Christian, then you should know that Christianity changes everything, the way you view everything in this world. That, they, that we can go on vacations and we can have a wonderful time but we're to declare the glory of God while we do it. Each and every person that we did encounter, we talked about Jesus Christ. Every time we had an opportunity to show our light, we showed our light to by the way that we loved one another. It changes everything. There is a problem in this world, and it's called sin. And a lot of people don't even realize that. They think good is good, bad is bad, that they'll be fine. But unless you're washed by the blood of the Lamb, you will not know an eternity with God. You'll know an eternity set apart from God. I don't ever even like talking about hell and circumstances like that because you can describe all, all of the things that, that hell might be, but all you need to say is it's an absence of everything that is from God. Everything that is good, all the blessings that you do love, don't let them become idols and everything. All the good things that you have are because God loves you. He's redeemed you by the blood of the Lamb, and you're to live your life for Him until you take your last breath or meet Him face to face. Life is brief, brief, I'll get it out, diadem is what you were searching for. Good job, though. Life is brief, death is certain. And then comes judgment. But see, the difference is we don't worry about that judgment because we know we've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. We know that our sins have been atoned for. And hopefully, you'll hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Everyone will experience death, but Christians will pass through. Death has no sting. Christina picked out good songs that go right with what I'm going to talk about today. 
Did you read your reading? There's a lot of reading these last three weeks. You read Joel, the entire book of Deuteronomy, Obadiah, Ruth, Acts chapters 1 through 11, and Psalms chapters 1 through 15. That's what you read in three weeks. That's a lot of reading. What did, what did, what did God say to you? Was it cumbersome or did you see Jesus in that? Was Deuteronomy hard or did you see all the standards that God put before? The faithfulness that he had for an unfaithful people. Moses warned again the next generation but then turned around and said, you're going to fail also. But that's why I had Merle read the scripture today that they, they we'll be known by a new name for the crowning glory of our God and, and Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'll start with a little bit of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible. It's the final book of the Torah, the, the law, explaining the sin problem that we have and setting up all these laws, which can be cumbersome if you just read through them without looking that all Scripture talks about Jesus. Remember, after His resurrection, He stayed around 40 days convincing His disciples, not just the 11, all of those who, who proclaimed to follow Jesus Christ, to give up this world and follow after Jesus, becoming fishers of men. He gave them convincing proofs that He was alive, that He had atoned for their sins, and that He lived forevermore. In Deuteronomy, we cover the fact in the preceding books that, they, that there's a sin problem. They've left, and God has established a nation. And for a year at Mount Sinai, He gives them the law so that they can be a people set apart in a pagan world that judgment has been pronounced upon. They're to live differently they're to tear down all the Asher poles, all the uh, other altars and everything, and love the Lord their God. And if someone else comes to faith, then they'll be part of Israel. Because it's not by birth, it's not by circumcision, it's by having the faith of Abraham. It's by knowing Jesus Christ and living a life of faith. Because without faith, without living a life of faith, it's impossible to please God. The entire Exodus generation were disqualified from the rest from the promised land. The spies were sent out, confirmed that the land was bountiful, a, a cluster of grapes that two men had to carry in. I cannot even fathom that. But yet they feared. They desired for what they didn't have anymore. They didn't put their faith and trust in God. Whatever the reason was, and that entire generation was disqualified. But God is faithful. And he carries their children into the promised land and two faithful men who love the Lord their God wholeheartedly, Joshua and Caleb. And Deuteronomy begins with Moses standing in front of this new generation and his job is to explain the significance of the laws so that you live a holy, set-apart life so that the world can see. Not just because he wants to make up all these rules for you, but so that you live differently that you are a people driven by your faith and love in God, your whole-hearted devotion. Because who wants half-hearted devotion, right? Look at your spouse and say, yeah, I want half-hearted devotion. No way. You want a whole-hearted relationship, and God wants you to love Him with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. Because you know the destination that you're headed for, so you should live differently today. But you can't unless you let your life through the Spirit transform you, give you a new heart, give you a mind of Christ. The book of Deuteronomy comes from the Greek word Deuteronomim. I'll try Deuteronomim. We do it all right? Which means a second law. You get this foretelling again. It's not cumbersome. It's an expounding upon, just like Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount, and said, you know that it's wrong to lust, to, to uh, we'll use murder. But if you've had anger in your heart, you might be guilty of murder. He's expounding upon the law so that you see the difference in how you're supposed to live. Some of the key teachings in Deuteronomy is Israel's obedience and devotion to the covenant. Israel's mission to be a kingdom of priests. Think about what Peter writes to the church, that we are a royal priesthood set apart in this world. God's promise to transform the hearts of His people. And if you live your life in step with the Spirit, the Spirit is transforming you and writing God's laws in your heart each and every day. But there is also a constant struggle with our sinful desires, is there not? 
They wage war against our very soul. If Satan can't have our soul, he at least wants to make us ineffective for the kingdom. So are you reading? Are you studying? Are you living that holy set-apart life that you have every bit of authority to live and every bit of power to live even in this pagan world? Moses summarizes the story so far, highlights the, the Israelites' rebellion. Paul writes about that. says these things were written to show us not to be stiff-necked, rebellious people, but to learn from these mistakes. He reminds them of the covenant. He reminds them of the Ten Commandments. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 4 through 6, you see this turning to the Lord with all of your hearts. To hear, O Israel, prayer that they would continue to pray for years and years and years. To hear, which means to obey. It's the same word. To hear and obey God's words. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Which if you're reading, if you're thinking, you know that Jesus summed the law up with that. That we are to love the Lord our God. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love God, you will understand His love for you and your love for others. So how in the world could you condemn someone else? And why in the world would you not want to give your life? Why would you not want to tell your story, what you have, this amazing salvation, so that maybe, just maybe, they might get saved, that they might come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Shema means to hear and to correspondingly obey. There is no other alternative. You don't let your ears hear and then go right out. You hear and obey, just like a child would understand. Clean your room. You heard it, now therefore do it. It's a responding to what you hear, an obeying, an obeying out of love. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, you shall love the Lord. Not a funny feeling, not because even what He's done for you, but because God is love, because of His character, because of His qualities. You don't know love until you know God. You might think you know love, but wait till something terrible comes across, that person does something to you, whatever it might be. Can you still love? Can you love your enemies? Can you turn the other cheek? Can you, when they ask for your coat, can you give them the shirt off your back too to be naked and exposed? Do you have a burning desire to face the inequalities, to, to have justice in this world, especially for the least of these? Or do we live the American dream, and so it is today, to have the most that you can have to live your life for you, and you deserve it, and all the other things that I could put with that? Or do we, when you see other people that are in poverty and injustice, does your heart break for them, and then do you do something about it? When we were coming back, we stopped to get fuel at one place, and a guy came up to me and said that he didn't have enough fuel to get home. And Sherry had $20. I didn't have anything. And we gave it to him. Ironically, in the middle of Montana, when I thought I had enough fuel to make it to the next gas station, we run out. <laughs> and somebody gives us gas. I don't know if that man was a Christian. I don't know if the man that I helped knew that I was a Christian, anything else. But I knew right off that he had a need, and I didn't ask for anything else. I didn't qualify it. I gave him enough to take care of what he said. How far you got to go? This should cover you. Because I had compassion. I didn't judge him, nothing else. And it came back to bite me <laughs> in a good way. And I thought about that the whole time. Wonder if things would have been a little differently. Wonder if I wouldn't have made it that last 11 miles because our, our bars went totally out and it was 11 more miles to this town and we pull into this town, town, <laughs> and there's a bar. Yeah! <laughs> but no gas or anything. But there's people there that are willing to help. I wonder if they were Christians. I wonder if they knew what the word Christian meant. Don't you want your light to shine? Don't you want to live such lives as Peter says that then when they ask you, you tell them about the hope that you have? Love the Lord wholeheartedly. It's not an emotion, not a feeling. It's a commitment. 
Oh, no wonder so many marriages don't make it. They don't understand that the, the vows that are written to love, to honor, to obey, till death, to we part, sickness, and in health, for better or for worse. Isn't that what love is? Keeping no records of wrongs, to, to love without the feeling that you get back, to love unconditionally because God loves you. If you know that, that's part of what being like Christ means. The one who gave up heaven and went joyfully to the cross before him. Not that it wasn't hard. Not that he didn't pray and sweat uh, drops of blood in his sweat. It's very, very hard. So that means that we need to live our life even more with the power of the Spirit committed in God's Word, letting Him lead us through it. That not even a hair on our head will be harmed if it's not in His will. And if we die, it's gain because we've passed through death to eternal life. So what's our reason for not loving one another? It was to make Israel obedient, to be devoted to God with their whole heart, their whole mind, so they know that God would take care of them in the world around them, even though they were condemned. Some of them would see the difference in their lives and come to a saving knowledge. They were to be kingdom of priests, a unique people in the, in the nations around them, not to absor absorb the pagan cultures of the nations around them. Oh, I wonder how we stand as a country of in God we trust. To show the world about God by living as a child of God. After Moses' passionate sermons, we come to a large collection of the laws in the center of the book, and they're arranged mostly by topic. It can seem to be burdensome, but as you read it looking through the lens of Jesus Christ and what God has done for us, how can you not want to live like that? If you're a good father of any bit whatsoever does your child not want to live like you live um, Kira said something to me on the way back and it tickled me you know made me feel so proud but broke my heart also and she said I wish you were my daddy and that was such a compliment but it was not and I don't know if Jacob will hear this or not and then Isaac said he said you really love us now, it's easy to do as a grandparent. Don't get me wrong, because we can spoil them, we can hand them back and everything else. But he said, you really love us. I don't know what that en encompassed in his mind. But he said, you love us, therefore we equate that with a good father. Don't you need to show how good, good, good your heavenly father is to you? And anything and everything that you do with all of your heart, not getting tied down by the things of this world. Strip them away, whatever it is. If it's the sins or the temptations or anything else, shed them all away and run this race with perseverance with each and every one who can help pick you up as we're going along. I'm so thankful for this church and how you lift me up in your prayers and how you're here for me and I'm here for you. As you read Deuteronomy, you see Jesus' words, you see his life over and over because the laws were designed to take care of those who had need for the poor, the least of these, the marginalized. The laws that were set up to give land back, to set apart a percentage of the crops and everything else. It was so there were no needy people among them. No, I'm not quoting Acts yet. I'm not there yet. I'm talking about Deuteronomy and the laws that were set up there. So that we could live civilly among ourselves by obeying their laws. How we're to live among each other so that the world sees that we live differently. After going through the laws, Moses offers a final challenge to the Israelites to listen and love their God. I'm looking, talking about Deuteronomy chapter 27 to 30. He warns and gives them an ultimatum. If Israel listens and obeys, things will go well. Blessings. If they don't listen and obey, things will not go well. Cursings. Choose this day. Those words echo in Joshua's out of Joshua's mouth also. so I think they echo out of Jesus' mouth that if you love me you will obey my commandments and you will be known by the way that you love one another and no greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for his friends Moses has a final 
forces a final decision. You can't just read Deuteronomy and not come up to whether I will try to obey or not, but I know that I can't obey, so I've got to submit myself to Jesus Christ to fall at the, at the cross and to say, Lord, increase my faith. In Deuteronomy 30, he says, Today I set before you life or death, blessings or cursings, goodness or evil. So choose life by loving the Lord your God and listening to Him, hearing and obeying, doing what He says to do. Love one another. Love your enemies. But he also says in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 30, he says, I know after that I die, you're going to rebel, to turn, turn away from God, and you're going to end up in exile. You've read Isaiah. You've read Jeremiah. You know, you've read so many of the minor prophets. Of course, we have some in this. And you know that finally God sent them into captivity, into Babylon, the world so that they could be captive of it, so that hopefully they would turn back to him and worship him. He didn't abandon them. He didn't leave them in Babylon. He's still God today. He still is God of this nation to those who put their faith and trust in him. It just seems like there's a lot less people that do that nowadays. <clears throat> and he says, there'll be a time when God will circumcise your hearts so that you may love him with your heart and soul and live. Does that not point to Jesus? Have your hearts been circumcised? The fundamentally wrong thing with Israel was their heart. Their heart was hardened. No matter who the father of their faith was, no matter whether they were circumcised or not, no matter whether the Ark of the Covenant led them or anything else, the problem was their heart. How about your heart? Is that ground soft? Has it been cultivated when the seed gets sown? Does it plant in or does it fall on the hard path? Does it fall in with weeds that choke it out later? Does it fall on soil that produces and produces and produces according to the Spirit, how the Spirit gives you? People wanted to define good and evil for themselves. Well, that sounds like the world today again, doesn't it? I'm a good person. I'm not bad. But Scripture tells us that God is going to do something. He's going to call a new people. He's going to graft in the Gentiles into this wild olive. He's going to give you a new heart and write the laws on your heart and on your mind. Are you letting him do that? Are you spending time in God's word? Is it troublesome? Is it hard to do? Do you have to set time? Or did you just want to read it every time you get a chance as it being a loving uh, letter from your father who has gone away and giving you advice and ways to live now until he returns and claims you? After Moses ends his speech with warnings and blessings, he walks up on the mountain and passes away. He himself doesn't get to go into the promised land because he himself cannot lead the people. He can give them the law. He can pray and intercede for them, but he is not the one who can save them. Even though Joshua leads them into the promised land, oh, Yeshua is his name. He points to Jesus. Do you not see that scriptures tell all about Jesus and what has to be done? That's what Jesus continually told to his disciples. The scriptures point to me. And then after he laid down his life and after he rose again, he stayed around 40 days continuing to teach them about the kingdom of heaven and convincing them that he was alive. Think about that. That's so that you will live for God today. You know that Jesus laid down his life. You know that he's alive. You know that he's gone to prepare a place for you. How are you going to live as a result then? Are you going to live for him today with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength? And are you going to love even your enemies? The Torah draws to a close. The law is out there. And as Paul says, I studied the law and studied the law and I thought I was doing so well until I got to the 10th commandment about coveting. Then I realized what a wretched, pitiful person I am. The law simply condemns me because there is no way that my righteousness will ever obtain salvation. So I've got to lay down my life for the one who laid down his life for me. 
except that saving grace. Not by any works of righteousness that I have done, but by God's amazing grace. Isaiah 62, which Merle read, says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet. Till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. You know, when you take that this little light of mine and you put it with another one, the flame increases in intensity, doesn't it? So that the world sees it even more. Are you burning brightly? Is it like your salvation like a blazing torch? The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name. They will see your glory because you are reflecting the light of Jesus Christ in your life, being glorified by living like Him. You will be called by a new name. I wonder if that it meant to be Christian. Because it said Antioch, they were first called Christians, right? That's where you just got to in Acts. That the mouth of the Lord will be bestowed. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. So you read Minor Prophet Joel. Wasn't too hard to read that one. You got it in one day, three chapters. Obadiah was even easier, one, right? They told the same old story. Joel is poetic form of the past destructions and future destructions. Can you learn from these examples? Because judgment's coming so that when you face the next judgment, you can say, I'm all right. I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. I am found not guilty. There will be an army of locusts coming. You have read Revelation, right? <laughs> to bring about God's judgment. Who could survive? Well, those sealed by the blood of Jesus. In Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, Even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart. Not with half a heart, with all your heart. With fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. It's not for show. It's not the things that you do. It's being totally transformed. Having the passion of Jesus Christ, who joyfully set out for the cross that was laid before him. And if anyone wants to be his disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after Jesus, who will make him into a fisher of men, who will make him like Christ, what the word Christian means, or little Christ. In Joel chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision, because you've got a decision to make, just like Moses before he died planted that decision out there before him. Choose, which one are you going to choose? For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. And the earth and heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for His people, a stronghold for the people of Israel and all those who have been grafted in, the children of God. Obadiah is the shortest of all the Old Testament books, and it talks about the judgment that's coming upon Edom. Remember that, Edomites? They came from Esau. Jacob and Esau, this constant struggle over who would be. And Esau says, I'll do it my way. I'll sell my birthright for a bowl of stew, for the things of this world, what I need right now for this instant gratification. Oh, it sounds like the world today again, doesn't it? Sell your soul. But judgment will come upon all, especially those who are so prideful, thinking that they're safe in their strongholds who let their brother be taken off to Babylon and instead of helping actually hurt them. Judgment is coming. Oh, you read about Ruth too, didn't you? Because Naomi went with her, with her husband to a foreign land, oh, to an enemy's land because there was a famine in this land. Maybe they did not trust God enough. If you notice when you read Ruth, God's not even really mentioned much, but there's this story here of what we do with our life and the steps that we plan out, but God directs our paths, doesn't he? And they go to a foreign land and the sons all die and now we've got a widow again who is poor, a poor widow who a Moabite woman says, I'll take care of you, I'll show you love and kindness and I'll take on your God. I wonder why she said that. Because Naomi, she turns her name to bitter, to sorrow. God's against me. But yet there had to be something there that Ruth saw in Naomi even in her time of despair that she was different. And she followed after Naomi back to her homeland, started providing for her, and met her kinsman redeemer named Boaz. 
And she gleaned from his field because he obeyed the law. He set aside that for the poor. And he even gave her more. He didn't have to give her more. But he gave her more so that she could take care of her family. And she worked hard. She wasn't lazy about it. She worked hard and gathered it all. And then eventually becomes redeemed by Boaz. And as we read the end of Ruth, we see the lineage of Jesus Christ. Wow. Is it just getting you excited? Don't you want to read more? Okay, you're going to read a lot of Psalms, and there's going to be a lot of things in there to, to think about as, as you read. Oh, Psalms 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take. There's a lot of people sit there, and you can't tell any difference at all in whether they're saved or not saved by the way they live their life. Oh, yeah, people are generally good, right? Until you see the evil. It's hard for me to accept that with Jeremiah. Who knows how desperately wicked man's heart really is. What if we didn't have any laws whatsoever? I always talk about it going when you're driving. <laughs> I mean, you don't get out on the road good and there's somebody that passes you doing 100 mile an hour, up a hill, two double yellow lines, passing three cars at one time, oncoming traffic. What if there were no laws what if there was no chance that he would get caught and have to pay the, the penalty, whatever it is? Could you imagine the chaos then? We're getting kind of that way in some of our cities and stuff now where the, it's out of control. <clears throat> Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Oh, that brings me to walking in step with the Spirit, does it, instead? as opposed to that. Or stand in the way that sinners take. Or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditate on His law day and night, who write those laws on their hearts, who teach them to their children when they get up, when they go to bed, when they're going about, when they're eating, all day long they tell them about God and the love that He has for them, so that they will tell their children, and their children will tell their children, and so forth and so on. And so there will be blessings instead of cursings in their lives. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season. Oh, that, that seed that is planted on soil that produces, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Oh, look at what Joel said. Look at what Obadiah said. Nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Not my righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness covering me. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Keep reading. Psalms 2. Why do the nations conspire? Why do they rage? Why do they plot in vain? Thinking that this is the better way. That if I accumulate this, if I do this, if I have power, if I have... Education, whatever it is, sounds like the world in the days of Jesus in, in Rome. Sounds like the world today. Sounds like the world we read in Babylon, in, in Revelation. When they cry because no one is buying their goods anymore. You know what happens when they quit buying goods from me on eBay? I'll just go out and tell people about Jesus. Then I might have to rely on daily bread for once. You can understand that. It'll just be another day in the life of a Christian, trusting in God day to day that He will provide for you. Did I say I'm looking forward to that or anything? I didn't say that. But I hope that I have enough faith that when that day comes, I can thank God for what we have and say, what do you want me to do now with what is before me? That's why best in Romania. Living a life, giving, dedicating to providing a way that the least of these can have an income, can have some pride. Not pride in a bad way, but have some pride whatsoever that they're human beings because they're taught that they're not human beings, that they don't even have a soul. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The king, kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Jesus is king. He is Lord. You either proclaim him today or you will proclaim him one day. Verse 7, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth your possession. You will... 
You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, your kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. You celebrate because Jesus Christ is your king, but you still tremble before him because of who he is, the creator of everything, who has given you life and redeemed your life from the pits of darkness. Therefore, your kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead you to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Okay, we're to Acts. Acts of the Holy Spirit through ordinary men, not just through the twelve. You've got the examples of Stephen. You've got the examples of Philip. You've got the examples of Barnabas. Barnabas, who means son of encouragement. He was encouraging to the 12 disciples because of the way he lived his life. What, one thing that he did, he sold his property and gave it, gave it to the apostles to distribute however they did so that there wouldn't be any needy people among them. And the Lord kept adding to their numbers daily. Is this what our church looks like? I didn't ask if this is what the churches in this, this county look like or in the United States looks like. Is this what our church looks like? Does our church look like an Acts church? Acts 1 said, In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote to you about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Began. He's not finished. He's using you to be his hands and feet. When somebody comes up in need to answer them, to give what you have, Peter said, I don't have money, but I do have this when, when the man came up to him. Until the day he was taken up to heaven. Where? To go prepare a place for us where I'll never be alone. Where He said, I promise to you that I'll ask the Father to send the comforter to you so that you'll be comforted so that you can comfort others in whatever condition that you're in. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over 40 days and spoke with them about the kingdom of God so they would know how to live just like Moses spoke to them. But Jesus didn't say, hey, you can't do it. Jesus said, all authority in heaven I have and I give to you the power and authority to go live like I live, to teach, to baptize, to train them up to obedience. He didn't say you can't. Moses said you can't do it and went and died. Didn't raise again. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and all that come to me will have eternal life. There's no way to the Father except through me. Now will you live a life of love, loving God wholeheartedly and loving others wholeheartedly? Yeah, I'm combining a lot, so don't get me wrong in paraphrasing. <clears throat> And then on one occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, completely immersed, 100% done. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're thinking flesh and blood again, not spiritual. <laughs> yeah, the kingdom has come. Therefore, repent and turn to God. He said to them, And it's not for you to know the times or date the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, Acts chapter 2, we see that happen at Pentecost. And it's so much irony here. No, it's not. <laughs> It's so much divine providence here that Peter stands up and says this. Verse 17, In the last days God says, I will pour out my spirit on all my people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Even on my servants and women. No offense, women, but think of the times of those days. They were property, just like the servants. Okay, But God will pour out his spirit on everyone. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. They will tell of the truth. Maybe prophetic things are things that come, but prophecy is knowing God's truth because it's written in your hearts that you know that God loves you so much that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You know that because it's written on your heart. 
I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Wait a minute, this sounds familiar. Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's quoting from Joel. This little minor prophet. The first thing Peter quotes is that. The day of the Lord is coming. Repent and live for him. So as we read, we see how they live for them. Verse 42, they devoted themselves. Wholehearted commitment. Because that's what love is, is you commit yourself to the other person. That's what you do when you hear, you obey, you're committed to it. It's not an obligation. It's, yes, sir, I'll be glad to do that. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, spending time together because they're part of the family of God, children. To the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. This is not talking about Barnabas yet. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Hopefully you read through, you see the persecution of the church. You see God's seriousness in Ananias and Sapphira. And when persecution came, there's this man Saul that you know what happens to him. But he's there approving and there's this persecution. But it, and instead of the church fading away, the church grew. Maybe we need a little persecution, guys, sometimes. Hmm. Maybe that'll set us straight a little bit. Ask here and Isaac. They got persecuted a little bit for their bad behavior. I don't know if they call it that. <laughs> But they got disciplined because I love them and want their behavior. And later I got that, that sweet thing that I was sold that broke my heart at the same time. In Acts chapter 4, all the believers were in one heart and one mind. 32, the mind of Christ. One heart fully devoted. So no one claimed that any possessions were their own. None of it. But they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Who is this man who defies death, who gave up his life to save you? And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy people among them. Why are there so many people in poverty and suffering in this country alone, let alone in the world? There's so much wealth in so few people, and there are so many wealthy people in this world compared to what they've ever been before, and yet poverty and injustice are the worst they've ever been. Because I consider what I have to be mine. I worked for it. It's mine. I don't thank God for the breath that he gave me each day, the, the ability to function, the things that he's put before me to take advantage of. Oh, it sounds like that rich fool who God required his life that day because he didn't understand that concept. For from time to time, those who own land, not just Barnabas or houses, sold them, brought the money from their sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who's a who the apostles called Barnabas. That just blows me away every time. Peter said, you're encouraging to me. <laughs> Which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that he owned and he brought the money and put it at his apostles' feet. If there were other people doing that, what else did Barnabas do that was so encouraging? Well, you see it how he stands up for this man named Saul as we get to that reading. And I'm going to close with Acts chapter 11. Because I want you to think about this. This is the first church that you see named. Ecclesia is used there. Jesus only talks about the word that is church when he says, I will build my church and I will discipline my church, basically, is how he uses it. And this is the first time we see that after that. We see that this church in Antioch. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Those who have been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So persecution is what scattered them. They had nothing. Who's going to take care of them? Saul was the one persecuting them, but God called out, Jesus called out to Saul and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was persecuting people, but they were Jesus' brothers. 
So he said, why are you persecuting me? So they get persecuted and they're scattered abroad. Who's going to take care of them if it's not other people willing to take care of them? Oh, I know who it would be. Government programs. I didn't say that, did I? So many people put their trust in things like that rather than their trust in God. What happens when you don't have that anymore? Will you trust in him then? They went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch under persecution doing what? Spreading the word only among Jews. Okay, so I'm persecuted. I went from church to church, not begging for anything, telling them about how good Jesus is to me even in suffering, and they lovingly gave me what I needed and so forth. But I'm sticking with the churches for now. We're going to put it that way. And my people, whatever that means. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch. That's the Gentiles. That's the other guys. The guys on the other side of the river. Those guys. That neighbor. And they began to speak to the Greeks also. Because they couldn't keep this good news just for themselves. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them. He will never forsake you. He's right there. His hand is doing the work as you're obediently putting yours out. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas. They didn't send one of the twelve. They sent Barnabas again. This guy who really loves the Lord, who doesn't consider anything his own, he just goes and does it because that's what he does. When he arrived and saw the grace, what the grace of God done, he was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Sounds like what Caleb and Joshua did. Maybe they'll listen. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went from there to Tarsus to look for Saul, to bring him on on this. This is the guy who persecuted them. They're being persecuted already, and he's going to bring the chief guy back to them. What's going to happen? And when he found them, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. I wonder how great Paul would have been in his missionary journeys. Not great in a oh, prideful way, but great in a ministry way. If Barnabas wouldn't have took him under his wing. Man, Barnabas is encouraging. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That's what I want you to think about. Why? If people come in this church, if people see you out on the street, will they know you are a Christian? The song even says they'll know we're Christians by our love. We can take that back to the principle Jesus taught. Will they see that in you? There are good people. But do you live a life that is so set apart and holy for God's glory that they see God in you are you obedient even to suffering the suffering of death on a cross oh if anyone come after me wants to be my disciple they must deny themselves it's not about me whatsoever what will happen to me period what I have anything else it's about taking up an a instrument of ridicule suffering and death because Jesus did for me and then I follow Jesus wherever he leads me and his hand will be with me. His power will be with me. His authority will be with me. <clears throat> and people will become saved. Verse 27. During this time some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Abagus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able. Now remember, disciples is anyone who wants to follow after Jesus. Okay? Look. <laughs> Don't take disciple and say that's that other guy. If anyone wants to be my disciple, if you say that you believe in Jesus Christ, then you should love the Lord your God wholeheartedly and love others. He will make you fishers of men. You should be known by your love. You should be obedient to Him, hearing and obeying all these things that were taught throughout scriptures that point to Jesus. And a severe famine would happen, so each of one gave as they were able. Some more, some others. All that soil that some produced 30, some 60, some 100. They decided to provide help for their brothers and sisters living in Judea. 
No question about, will they have enough? When will this, when will this famine ha ha take place? Let's have a board meeting for it. Hi, darling. <laughs> they just gave because <laughs> Jesus was in their heart. They couldn't help but give. This they did, sending their gifts by the elders to Barnabas and Saul. Before Jesus left, he said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And when asked about how these things were going to happen and, and what power and authority that we were going to have in this world physically, as Americans, as whatever, he said, don't worry about that. But you will receive power to do what I've told you to do when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That should characterize what the word Christian means. And it was at Antioch that they were first called Christians because of how they behaved in this foreign world, even under persecution. I don't think many of you are being persecuted too much right now. So do you have any excuse why you're not giving everything that you can to God while you can? While you still have breath? Because the day of judgment will come. And even if, yes, you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, you're still going to be accountable for every idle word let alone how you've obeyed and how you've worked out this salvation that you have with fear and trembling. No matter how much you love the Lord your God because you've put aside these other loves and you've been faithful only to Him because He was so faithful to you that He would give His one and only Son to save you. What else has any priority in your life other than living for the King of kings, the Lord of lords? His name is Jesus. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this church. We thank you for all the grace upon grace upon grace that, we have, that you have given us. Help us to not be prideful. Help us to be humble at heart. Help us to be loving, kind, considering what we have to be a blessing from you so that we can bless others. To know that we have the comfort of the Holy Spirit so that we can comfort others. To know that we have life so that we can tell others about life. May we continue each day to live for you more and more than we did the day before. I thank you and praise you for each of these brothers and sisters that I have a blessing to be a part of. Help me to be an example as they are an example to me, Lord. And may we live a life that brings glory and worth and honor to you until we meet Jesus face to face. We pray this in his name. Amen.